Hello and welcome to this panel discussion, Improve Visibility of Research Software for Career Development. We're here today thanks to a collaboration between the Australian Research Data Commons, Australian BioCommons and the Australian Bioinformatics and Computational Biology Society. My name is Christina Hall and I'm the Australian BioCommons Associate Director, Training and Communications, and I'm here to get things started. A shout out to Paola Martinez from ARDC and Matt Field from Abacus who helped pull together today's event and are assisting us behind the scenes. We're here today to discuss how you can make, share and maintain good research software in a way that will advance your career. We're going to hear from a diverse group of panellists who invest a lot of their time writing, reviewing and maintaining bioinformatics software tools. Before we begin, it's important to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional owners um, and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet today. And in my case, that's the Ngunnawal people. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognize their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. It's great to see so many of you joining us live today and to help get the most out of the session, there are a few things to be aware of. The session is being recorded and you'll soon find it on the Australian Biocommons YouTube channel. And while your name is visible to other participants, your camera is only visible to panelists. The only panel, only the panelists videos uh, will be recorded. Auto generated captions are available during the webinar. You can turn these on and off uh, using the live transcript function in the Zoom dashboard. We'll take questions from the audience after the panel discussion, and some great questions have been submitted by registrants already, but please do add your live questions via the chat function as we go. We want to encourage a lively chat box today, and if you have any resources or tips to share, please pop them into the chat and we'll follow up and share them with all the registrants when we send out a notification that the recording is um, now live. If we miss any important questions today, we'll also follow up with the answers in that email. Given the number of us here today, it's really important that everyone keeps their microphone muted unless they're speaking. And with all that said, I'm very happy now to hand over to our MC for the day, Associate Professor Dennis Bauer. Hello, everyone. It's so exciting to see almost 80 people online. So software engineering certainly resonates with a lot of us, I guess. So yeah. As Christina was saying, uh, my name is Dr. Dennis Bauer. I'm a government research agent. Um, uh, I'm, I'm government research scientist, professor at Macquarie University and an AWS data hero. The traditional owners that I'm on is here in Sydney, which is the um, Valamatagangu people. And I would encourage you to acknowledge the traditional owners of the country that you're on in the chat function below. So with that, let's introduce the stars of this session, which is the panelists. Can I please introduce Associate Professor Kima Mikau. She is an NHMRC Career Development Fellow at the School of Mathematics and Statistics at the University of Melbourne. And we, of course, know her from the R Toolkit Mix or Mix, where the 2017 paper already attracted more than 1,000 citations so far. With that achievement, it's no wonder that she has a whole suite of awards uh, and recognitions. And I think the most dazzling one is probably the Homeward Bound, where she got to explore Antarctica with a lot of other women um, to build her career. Next up, we have Dr. Sonika Tiangi uh, from the Central Clinic School, Monash University. She's an adjunct senior lecturer and machine learning lead at Superbug AI, which looks at uh, combating antimicrobial resistance. She also is the author of four simple recommendations for encouraging best practices in research software, which is very topical and has reached an altmetric score of more than 120. So obviously this is a topic that resonates with people quite broadly. Then as the early career voice, we do have Mr. Fred Jaga. And uh, so he is a research assistant at the School of Life and Environmental Science at the University of Sydney. And he's currently doing his master's with Aaron Darling and 
Barbara Brito Rodriguez. And then as the voice of wisdom, we do have Professor Gordon Smythe from the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute. He's a, a co-division head there, and of course has developed blockbuster tools like Lima and Agile. And I think he can give us a very good overview of how software development practices have changed over his career and how to stay on top of all these developments that surely we all will face um, over our career. So with that, I'm sure hearing all this talent and expertise on the panel, you have a million and one questions. So I'm encouraging you to put them in the, in the chat function below. All right, so with that, to the panel. Can I please start by going around the panel and uh, for you to highlight things that you think are important. Now I introduced you with your standard CV, but given the topic, there might be other things you want to highlight. Specifically, for example, um, how the software that you developed has influenced your career so far. With that, let's start with Kim Mann. Hi everyone, uh, so I'm associate professor at the University of Melbourne in the School of Mathematics and Statistics. And I would say that I work more in a, the field of computational statistics and biology. Um, and yeah, Mixomics has been defining in my career, but it wasn't planned that way at all. Um, I think it started first when I was doing my PhD. We were two PhD students working on very similar methods for omics data integration. And my supervisor at the end of my PhD said, oh, you know what, you could do a R package out of this and you could do it a toolkit. And I thought, oh, this is way too much work. Software is really not my thing. Like I use it and I got in R fine, but actually I wasn't keen at all. Uh, but I did it because I don't know, I just thought, well, why not? I mean, I can try. We only have two methods at that time. It's, it seemed easy. Um, and along the years when I arrived in Australia as a, as a junior postdoc, then I augmented uh, the package. Um, and it took a long, long time to, to actually be recognized by the community. So the first version of my package was 13 years ago. And I would say that it's only been popular maybe eight years ago, or so or maybe even less than that. Um, but it's really been, I mean, I think for me it was the best move. It was to align my package with my research, uh, to make sure that my methods had the same way of uh, working so that the package would be very homogeneous in a way. And I think this is what makes Mixomics um, quite popular now, uh, first because it's niche uh, and because we were amongst the first, and also because the methods work under the same principles. And so once you understand one method, then it's easier to, to use the other methods and to answer more complex questions. Excellent. Thank you for that. Yeah, so consistency and being early in the field is probably something that resonates with Gordon. Gordon, over to you. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Dennis. Um, I'm, I'm, um, it's a bit hard to pick one thing. I, I'll, I'll just, I'll just sort of uh, start with, start with a few things. I was, I was actually, I actually thinking back, I've always been interested in software development, uh, even back in the days when software development meant writing a Fortran program by punching little chads out of a paper card. Um, and uh, the number of developments that it's the evolution that it's been through is uh, um, that's it's just just amazing. But um, uh, so I used to be a mathematical statistician working in a math department and uh, did over 20 years ago, I moved to the WEHI uh, to work in medical research the same year that the human genome was published. So, so I so so as as uh, uh, so I was in at the right time, and I've been working on statistical analysis of genomic technologies ever since. And and software development, and software is intrinsic to bioinformatics work in medical research. You can't do anything without interacting with software. And when we started, there were no software tools to do the things that we wanted. We had to create software tools to do our own analyses. So I've always 
uh, we've always developed things for our own use and made them sort of public, made them public at the same time, but they were always driven by the need to do something for ourselves. And, and we needed new statistical tools, not just new software tools. It wasn't a matter of just transferring an existing method into a new software infrastructure. It was a matter of creating a, a body of new statistical theory. So um, yeah, so, 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 uh, so it would be, in some ways it would be hard to, hard to replicate that we were, we were lucky to be in at the start of microarrays and then at the start of RNA-seq and the start of CHIP. Um, so I have a few other things I want to say, but I'll, I'll, I'll send it back to you, Dennis, and you can ask me later <laughs> on. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, definitely. Developing new algorithms and really making them purpose-built for the application, that is so important. Sonica, I'm sure you agree. Oh, absolutely. And um, to start with, it's a, it's a great ple pleasure to share the podium with, you know, two stars <laughs> of Australia, you know, Kiman and, and Gordon, um, you know, Gordon's HR has been the, the most cited, you know, RNA-seq tool. And uh, two years ago, I saw PLOS Computational Biology Status where I'm a guest editor being the one of the most cited tools. So uh, it's definitely, you know, great pleasure to be here. Um, so to begin with, um, you know, about, you know, my, my career and my, you know, the contribution of, of these software tools, you know, both in the on the development side as well as as a user, so I a uh, huge thanks to and shout out to the the open um, software tool community as well as the data community, uh, because uh, my entire you know research career has been has been dependent on uh, you know access to open data and open software tool, and um, I have learned um, you know to. Uh, give back to the community and uh, learning these uh, open practices uh, just on the job. And uh, um, so the, the tools that uh, we, I've developed in my career, so I've had a pretty much 50-50% career, both in as a professional bioinformatician as well as academic since uh, the completion of my PhD in bioinformatics. And uh, uh, so a lot of uh, tools, as, as Gordon said, you know, some you you'll have to write tools. You know, what, once you're working in the computational biology area, you'll have to write tools at some point, and uh, a, a lot of which probably didn't make it to a software level. But like, there's just some bunch of scripts lying here and there, and slowly we learn to you know uh, consolidate those, share those, version control. So all of that uh, I've learned uh, like through my career and still learning to use uh, new technology to make these software. Uh, shareable version control, visible as well as re re reusable. So um, yeah, so I'm, I'm, uh, it's it's great to be here and uh, uh, look forward to the discussion as as it uh, goes along. Yeah, fantastic, definitely fantastic to have you on the panel. So open source software development that must be something that resonates with you, Fred, in doing your masters in Aaron Darling's lab. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, I'd like to say that it's this is quite intimidating being on a panel with such distinguished and experienced uh, researchers. Um, but yeah, yeah, being uh, doing my masters with Aaron was really rewarding. It was challenging, but it was really rewarding. Um, I started, so I came from. I did my bachelor's in pure biology, and I heard about bioinformatics as this cool thing in a final year genomics lecture. So then, ever since then, that's where my heart was set. So um, learn a bit of coding in undergrad. And um, in terms of how software and I guess broadly coding has helped me advance my career as a student was I think it helped with not only applying for positions um, after my undergrad and as well as applying for the masters, just having um, my code visible, having a GitHub and having repositories I can show to future employees or supervisors. Like I don't, as an undergrad, it's hard to publish a paper. So being able to show something uh, that you are capable of, I think has uh, helped me a lot. And for me, um, I, I haven't really developed software for other users on a broad scale. Um, I've mainly developed software and pipelines mainly for myself. Uh, to for my masters mainly, so I use Nextflow. I developed a pipeline in Nextflow to um, benchmark uh, bioinformatic tools used for detecting recombination. Um, and 
going through that entire process, I had to, it wasn't just about putting programs together and running them one at a time. It was like I had to learn Python, I had to learn HPC, and it was the first time I was um, exposed to a lot of these. So uh, for me, developing software and programming is uh, a very skills-based thing. Here, here, for sure. And going forward with the accreditation process and probably GitHub um, as a metrics of success, that probably will be much more important going forward. Good. So thank you for that for, with the first question. With that, a uh, reminder again to the audience to pop your questions into the chat. And we're trying to get to the questions at the end. The ones we can't get to, they will be answered in the follow-up questions. So don't feel like you need to hold back because there's no time anymore. Good, with that, to the next question, which is around how do you actually know when a software area is ready to be, uh, to be made into something that is shared with other people? So we all have probably a lot of scripts and tools and things that we just tested out, but when do we know that we should put enough effort or the effort, appropriate effort into it in order to share it. So Gordon, how can we, uh, how we, how do we know that we sit on the next lima and putting the appropriate effort into making that available? Well, um, uh, okay. Well, I won't say uh, there isn't an answer to how do you know when when you're going to make a lima or edger. To to be, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll tell you with edger when we made edger, I. Uh, in, in particular, Lima was a slightly different story. But when we made Edgar, I did not, I did not initially. We created that package before RNA Seq existed, right? And uh, we we developed it for Sage and for Cage, and I mean the methodology, the statistical methodology of the Sage. And we did not know it was going to be so important. I gave it to a PhD student, Mark Robinson, as a as a second project, and uh, um, excuse me, I have to go and silence my landline spam. <laughs> In that case, uh, quickly go to Kiman. You already alluded to that Mixomics. You didn't know it's going to be that big. Yeah, I think you have to be convinced yourself that it will be useful for others. And the way I develop my methods is I actually apply them to a bunch of different data sets for my collaborators. So I already have this test experience and hands-on experience. And this is where even with my students now, I start to say, look, is, is your code actually applicable really easily on that data set? And about that one, and how about that one? And so they start to learn how to make it easy to use. Um, and then you push it out and see what happens. I mean, you have to anyway to um, you know provide um, a, a, some sort of package on GitHub now when you publish. I think it's it's compulsory. It should be compulsory. Uh, it's definitely uh, the standard in my in my group. Um, even when we uh, publish uh, reviews, I ask uh, people in my group to also um, share the the GitHub page because I say, look all the analysis you did for that review to benchmark all those methods, it will be useful for people. People want to have the code. They don't want to have to understand, dig into what is the method, where did they find it, how did they apply it. Um, so it's worth the effort. And then as Gordon uh, said, um, sometimes it picks up and sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes you're a little bit too early. Um, and so you have to kind of wait and see how things go. And then maybe two or three years down the track, you can see suddenly that there's quite a bit of interest in your method. And this is where then you start to make more effort in the development and the design of the package or the whatever tool you have software. <laughs> yes, for sure. Uh, throw it out and fail fast. And if not, put in the event. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, Fred, in terms of the incentives, what do you see as the most effective incentive in order to make, to go the extra mile and making it publicly available and put the documentation around it and so on? For publications, think, for example. Yeah, I, th I think the answer was sort of in the question. It's like, um, if you want to make it publicly visible, you do need a level of documentation that's not understandable to yourself. So if you need to come back to something like a few scripts, a few months later, you'll have no idea. You'll have a, a better idea of what you're trying to do. But um, yeah, just thinking about um, how you can 
document and arrange things in a way that could be useful for other people. And uh, I guess another incentive for me for sharing my code is um, I often use, in my experience, I've been the first to use a new tool or a new, uh, a new programming language like Nextflow. Uh, when I was doing my master's, I was one of the first students that started using it. So having that available, I could, uh, and then um, when another student had to troubleshoot with Nextflow, I can just link them to a particular part in the GitHub repo. Um, so I, I find that quite useful. Yeah, brilliant. So using the software development tools that are available in the IT sector and bringing that into research. Sonica, working in a big um, project like Superbug AI, I'm sure good software practices and, and doing that is important as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, just so just to um, um, address your original question. So uh, my, my take is that, you know, make your uh, software shareable as soon as you can. Because you know, you you go out in the community, you uh, build connections, you get collaborators, you get feedback, and you build trust. And uh, and throughout this process, you improve improve the software. So maybe it wasn't in the form uh, when you shared it first uh, that was intended, but maybe through all this feedback and and collaborative work, maybe it will get there, and uh, you might make all those improvements. You know, in, in the beginning. So so uh, that that that's my my advice. And uh, so, so not only, you know, your, your contribution will be recognized, you also have these incentives to, you know, work on it. And when, when there is, you start seeing interest and usefulness of the tool that, that you are working on. So, and yeah, so th those are the, you know, kind of uh, uh, practices I, I try to teach in my team as well uh, that, you know, um, so uh, we develop this, uh, this software primarily out of research need. Okay, so not necessarily, you know, you are trained as a, as a software engineer and following all those best practices, but slowly, you know, um, you, you need to see what your priorities are. So generally it is the research outcome. You may be, you know, needing this data for your you know, next uh, thesis milestone or publication or grant, but then you need to uh, also start looking at the technology that, that is going behind you know, de developing that piece of tool, as well as, uh, you know, looking at the long-term outcome as a, as a research product. So, so try and look, uh, you know, look at the, the bigger picture and see where you want to see this, this piece of uh, software going forward. Right, yeah. So you and Kiman alluded to that establishing good practices in your group is absolutely crucial. Can you give us some hands-on tips of what tools um, or practices you actually use uh, in your day-to-day -day life? So definitely uh, version control. Uh, to, to begin with, uh, that's very important and uh, a good uh, piece of documentation. And, uh, you know, as you start writing the tool, I think you need, need to start writing your log as well, you know, the, the documentation, you know, what you're doing, why, why you're doing. And later on, it can, uh, you know, turn into a user guide and you have all the history of, you know, why you made some certain decisions and it's, it's all, all logged for you. Um, then in the, uh, and then um, probably, you know, uh, using uh, technology so, so that it's transferable. Um, so it, it making your tools, thinking about, you know, portability, portability of your tools as well is, is, is also important in the long run. So that, that's my, my uh, uh, tips. Yeah, excellent. Kiman? You're mute. <laughs> I think on a day-to-day -day basis, my my really strong requirement is to have people using our markdown um, because we do a lot of data analysis. And so I want to make sure that everything's running. There's no hard-coded things in the background that, uh, you know, cannot make uh, our analysis reproducible. Uh, so for me, um, yeah, having transparent reproducible analysis is key in order to, you know, to progress. And I, I really uh, try to uh, advocate for that. Excellent, Fred. So in the outside of R, so you, you're developing outside of R, what will be some tools in that space? Um, so the most recent, I think, proper software development thing I did was uh, Nextflow. So developing a pipeline for uh, benchmarking and uh, I guess to add to the previous question um, what are some best practices I really enjoy uh, 
maybe, maybe it's an obvious one, but especially during prototyping, I struggled with knowing where should go, where things should go, like what should go on GitHub, what should stay in Dropbox. And when there are massive uh, input data files, where do you put them? So just having an idea of where you want to place things before you get too, in, uh, too far deep and it becomes uh, messy, I think is quite good. Um, also, I, I guess sharing, uh, another benefit of sharing my code or showing my peers with what I've done was I've, I was... <laughs> Uh, with Python, I I went uh, Python self-taught Python, um, and when I showed it to a to someone who actually was experienced in Python, <laughs> I was a bit ridiculed, but that was extremely constructive. So I, from then, I I, I picked up heaps of um useful small tips here and there. Uh, so sh uh, sharing code, getting feedback on your code, I think is uh, very valuable as well. Yeah, that's good. Now that we lost Gordon, I might step in and give you a quick <laughs> rundown of, of, of my experiences as well. Um, so Paula just shared a nature paper in there and scrolling through around software engineering and scrolling through it, one of the um, headlines, there is no excuses around reproducible research. But I think it's easier said than done because when you actually look into it, even if we're working in, say, R, for example, it's not necessarily the same environment for all of them. It's not necessarily the same drivers, the same implementation, the same compilation of it. And so there are slight variations to that. And obviously, the extension from that was Docker, but I'm really um, in depth here, technically. Um, but even that has some limitations. So I, I think, in terms of the reproducible research journey, it was just not there. And the closest that I found was when we go to public cloud providers and therefore having the same hardware, the same setup um, automatically spun up in virtual machines and attaching the workflow and the data to that is probably the closest to the reproducible research ideal that I found so far. Yet in my experience, researchers are not really embracing that. So that will be something um, maybe as a bioinformatics community, we could look into closer. Good. But with that, let's go back to uh, the questions for the panel, which is around how to actually maintain then that beautiful, fantastic rock star tool that, you, uh, that everybody loves, how to put in the resources and find the funding in order to maintain something that is perceived to be just a software. Let's start with Sonica. I think it's a it's a million dollar question. <laughs> yeah. So how to how to maintain it and sustainability? You know, uh, finding people to uh, continue to maintain the quality and keeping it up to date. Uh, you know, in the world where data and technology are are ever changing. But I think uh, I, I don't think you know um, I have a direct answer to this. But uh, it's it's like manifold. I know just uh, making people. The answer is manifold. That you know making people aware of you know why why it is important because th this has been my feeling that you know research software uh, development part has is is undervalued. And uh, in the end, we, we look at the, you know, the fantastic outcome uh, that, that we publish in you know, big papers, but you know, the, all the little software that you know, were developed to get to that point, sometimes they get undervalued or you know, they, they lose their visibility you know, after the paper is published. So I think uh, just general awareness that uh, these tools uh, you know, can be maintained and we need, we need resources to maintain those uh, is, is important. So it can come up at a different level you know, in, in your, in your little research group to to institute you know making all the, the like uh, funding agencies and um, uh, publications you know making uh, these um, um, what do you say the, the metrics you know important and uh, that can also add to the the career development of the of the developer so I think uh, at different level we can uh, make uh, contributions to uh, to have these uh, uh, metrics counted. Uh, towards, um, you know, showcasing uh, someone's, you know, contribution as well as talent and skills uh, that has led to some big discoveries in, in medical research. 
Excellent. And just a preview, the next million dollar question is how to actually quantify a software product is successful. So I'm going to ask you that as a next question, but let's stick with the how to maintain the Blockbuster um, tool that you've developed. Gordon, you're just back in time for exactly that. Can I throw directly to you? How do you find the funding and the money available to keep uh, Agile going? All right, so while you find the unmute button, <laughs> let's go to Fred from your perspective. I know you probably haven't written grants and so on. So maybe you have a more diverse grassroots up approach of how to find the funding for software development. Ah, uh, supervisor, big supervisor. But um, yeah, so I've, the, I guess my short answer is when do I need to maintain software is when I need to rerun things. So super downstream, I've done all of these analyses and then I realized, okay, um, based on the results, it looks like we need to do something else, maybe change a few parameters upstream and then rerun things. So that's when I would rework things. How do you find, Kiman, the magic money for... Well, there's no magic fun? money. And to be honest, there's no money. <laughs> Often, <laughs> uh, as Sonic has said, it's undervalued, which is really funny because when I think about my impact, the only thing that comes to me is, well, I created that toolkit. It's been downloaded so many times. That's my impact. And for some reason, um, in the Australian system, uh, it's not considered as research. Um, and so I guess... At the beginning, I didn't have a lot of money, so I was just scrapping by, just finding a little bit of money here and there. Um, but as I said before, um, by aligning my methods development directly to the package, I could say, look, I want to develop those methods, and those methods will be implemented in a package. And so when I obtain funding for, say, a postdoc, that postdoc will also be tasked in um, implementing the tool and maintaining it. And of course, you need to find the right person who loves developing methods as well as implementing and maintaining a, a package that is growing and growing. Um, but that was really my, the way I, I managed <laughs> along those years. And I noticed in the past few years that, uh, you know, you now we do have a bit of funding for software development. So I'm thinking about the Shan Zuckerberg Foundation, um, or there's a few initiatives now that seem to slowly recognize the value of software implementation and maintenance. Um, but yes, you, I mean, it doesn't come for free uh, at all. And so you kind of, I think as, a, as in someone who are, has a lab, uh, you always have this in the back of your mind of how do I find the money in order to continue with um, the software. Yeah, slow and steady conversation with the funding agency to make the value of software uh, recognized. Gordon, are you back with us? Can you? Oh, my apologies. Uh, my apologies. In I, I had to reboot my entire internet uh, and all my computers. Um, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, look, um, uh, funding is a problem. As, as uh, Kim Ann was saying, uh, Australia probably has less funding for less research funding for software development than other countries. And I work in a medical research institute where our primary funding for is NHMOC. And NHMOC is the worst of all funding organisations anywhere in the world for funding software development. They are they will occasionally fund. Uh, they will occasionally fund a new software tool for a new technology. But the idea of software maintenance or long-term development of software is completely absent from their thinking. And there is no slow and slow and steady discussion with them. It is not on their radar at all. I would say they are more. They are getting worse rather than better. Um, uh, so, um, uh, so, so my lab is currently uh, currently um, supported by Chan Zuckerberg uh, grant, and that's our second Chan Zuckerberg grant. Without that, we would be in very difficult 
straits. Um, and, uh, you know, um, I, you know, uh, bioinformatics groups looking at it from overseas would assume, oh, you're a well known group, you would be well funded. That is not how it works in Australia. It is really the NHMSE is the most regressive organisation from software development or long term bioinformatics that I can imagine. Um, so I've uh, got that off my chest. But um, uh, for it's but there are other, you know, there are other sources we have to go to. We have to go to, um, you know, philanthropic. It's, it's quite funny. I get funded by social media because I'm the most unsocial media person that, that there is. So uh, my, my group thinks that's funny. Uh, but there's more philanthropic funding. There's uh, maybe the MRFF in some circumstances. So we have to go to other we have to go to to other sources. Um, but can I pop in something else, which Kim Am was alluding to? It's, you know, if you want software to software to help your career. Um, well, well, let me let me say that that in the medical world, uh, they really pay a lot more attention to citations of journal articles rather than to software downloads and things like that. So what we do is we uh, so so we publish papers which are associated either describing the software or or describing the methodology which is implemented in the paper. So so it's the so the software drives the citations of the paper, and and um, and. Uh, and if I might get back to your original question, which was uh, interrupted, how do we know that something, you know, something is going to be useful? Well, because we're trying to do some sort of medical research for which there is no methodology. So we have to do something new. And if we have to do something substantial that is new um, uh, for types of data that other people are using, um, then that's, uh, that will be something that will go public. Excellent. Um, yeah, thank, thank you for that, Gordon. So yes, how do we though record? So you're saying citations or the downloads of the software is probably not going to cut it, but what other metrics can we put around it? You were saying that medical research in itself and providing a tool that solves something in medical research that wasn't possible before should by itself be the um, the, the definition of what is important. But I yes, think we need to have, have to something. Establish, but you have to establish that people find it important, uh, not just yourself. So, so journal citations and downloads, those are the two most important metrics that we use. Okay. Has there anyone on the panel a different opinion to that? I also think like if you can register your software uh, with uh, some, you know, open source uh, registries or even there are journals like open source, um, you know, software journals, I'm forgetting the names, but uh, and can get a unique DOI that is citable because I, I know a lot of tools that I have used. I don't know how to cite them. I can only use the URL directly to, to cite them. So probably, you know, also think about, you know, how that if you want uh, your tool to be, your software tool to be citable, then try and get an DOI. So yeah, that, that, that's what I will add to it. It's interesting that none of you have mentioned commercial success of the softwares. Now, obviously open source um, has a problem with the traditional commercialization, but there are other ways of doing that. Might that be a way of um, circumventing the, the funding or lack thereof from NHMRC, AIRC? What are your opinion? Um, let's start with Kiman. Yeah, I did think about that. Um, it's, it's a bit hard because yes, our code is open source. And so as soon as, you know, if you want to sell your software, you have to close uh, the open source, so that may not align ethically to what you want to do as a as an academic researcher, for example. So that's the kind of issues I have faced. Um, I think there are companies that might be they yeah they, they're more interested in using your your software rather than helping you <laughs> to actually maintain it. So I feel that. Um, company like I don't know next generation sequencing companies. Um, just happy to use it 
and use it in their platform, but not necessarily help out in maintaining it. Um, that's my experience of all the discussions I've had so far. Excellent. Anyone else from the panel wanting to jump into that? Sure. Can I can I say something to that? Um, yeah. So. Uh, so I've always argued against um, commercialization with our BDO officer. Uh, so, so for one thing, I think it would uh, it would be a recipe for just nobody using our software. Um, so, so open source and sharing of data sort of goes back, uh, you know, is very much part of the um, genomic uh, genomic development. So, so open source and free software is important for cooperating with other tools. But there's a but there's a deeper reason I think why software is generally not being commercialized. The the reason for commercialization, in my opinion, is not so much to make money, but because you need the resources of a commercial company. So the reason why we commercialize drug development is it's impossible to get a drug to market without a large pharma company. You have to cooperate, otherwise you can't get to market, but we have been able to get our software to market directly through open source development projects. So we've so we've been able to get out. So so we've been you know through sources uh, development projects like uh, like um, Cran and Bioconductor, we can get our software out and directly used. We're sort of at the limits of what we can maintain within our academic resources so perhaps you know perhaps there's a possibility in the future for some sort of commercialization but generally commercialization does not go with cooperation and with uh different packages acting synergistically so yeah, it's that's not it. not generally a good uh a good uh pathway for in in the genomic world yes so yeah. the traditional way of thinking about that for sure um, hampers that. Paula has sent in. I, I, I also wanted to just add, yeah. uh, if I may. Uh, so even though I'm a big uh, promoter and supporter of open science, open source software, but if you have to, if you want to even make an option for commercialization of your open source tool, there, there are licenses available where you can have a separate license condition for its commercial use. So there is a possibility to have both sides. Happen. Yes, so definitely there, are, there is a transition to maintaining open source collaboration and sort of that beautiful world, but still having the option of commercialization. And Paula um, put a link into the chat of, from opensource.org of how they think about um, commercialization. Open source 2.0, I think, is, is a term to look up if you're interested in that. Good, but with that, let's go to the audience questions. Um, let's start with the one um, around, should the process of code review be made mandatory uh, when, a, uh, when a paper is submitted and the reviewer is looking at it? My like code review is a common practice in the software industry, so why not do it in the, in the research world as well? Uh, Fred, what do you think? And would this be a, a fantastic, new, exciting new way, or is this just a time drain? I think it would be nice. Uh, I think I'd be more interested in wondering what happens to the review. If the code and the code review is made available along with the paper, I think that would be extremely beneficial for a lot of applied and end users such as myself, because a lot of the, the methods in, in the bigger journals that you want to replicate, they, they skimp out on the, the, the tiny details and having the code available um, would be helpful. And having someone review it, so knowing where you, what parts that you can be pretty confident of keeping and what parts you should change for your own data so, um, would be, I think would be really useful. Uh, I'm not too sure how that will fit in the, in, in the logistics if they'll make um, make things harder for early career researchers and students, but um, I definitely see great benefits in that. Yeah. Kiman, what are your opinions? Um, yeah, I think so, but you know, it's a matter of you know how much time you want to invest in that. So when I review articles that propose a method and say, hey, yes, our code is available on GitHub, I always look at it. 
And I can tell if, you know, the, the first offer actually made the effort to make it accessible or not. And if not, I may just put a line or two saying, hey, it doesn't look like I can use that myself. So definitely having at least one first pass uh, to make sure it's understandable, there's enough comments, um, I think uh, is worthwhile. The, the full code review is, is quite hard. And um, I often also trust people who develop those codes that they will improve as they go. When there's more usage um, of their method, then you will also push them to update a little bit. If people say to them, hey, I can't run this, or I don't understand why it doesn't work anymore. But of course, you know, there's always a risk that someone doesn't want to spend time on that. And I'm not sure you can really expect people to do all those jobs at once. Yeah. Yeah, like thinking practically the diversity of research in bioinformatics, if you have to do an actual code review in an area that you're not quite familiar, that could be uh, very challenging. So in that case, you alluded to that collaboration and then demonstrating the long term viability and beautifulness of the code, if you want. Um, a question from the audience is what kind of network uh, platforms or other approaches are you using in order for collaborations? I think uh, GitHub is a great place to start. Monica, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think GitHub is a great, great place to start, uh, uh, you know, sharing your code and collaborating, you know, starting issues. And this also covers, you know, a bit of, you know, the code review part as well, because uh, they become their, and the community become their beta testers and they do, they provide, all, you know, all the, reports on the bug and something that is not working. So uh, yeah, um, so I, I think uh, GitHub, there are uh, various you know, open science uh, forums and programs as well. I also encourage students to submit uh, their uh, uh, you know, software-based projects to these uh, bioinformatics community conferences, such as you know, BOSC or BioK Asia. And I've always appreciated, you know, our reviewers going through the code, running it, and and uh, you know, give, giving us uh, valuable feedback. So all of those uh, places, and um, yes, this has also happened with us that uh, you know reviewers have uh, told us about some other group who is working on a similar idea, and why don't you collaborate with them? So that has also happened uh, with us. Yeah. So so going to all all these places, um, the open community conferences, you know. GitLab, GitHub, uh, uh, having uh, issues uh, tracked on, uh, you know, open uh, discussion forums will, will be a great idea. Brilliant. Now we have five minutes left, and I always like to end with something that the audience can take home. So as a really tough, challenging question, can you give us the one thing that everybody should know, should learn, should look up today in order to become a better software developer? Let's start with, come on. <laughs> <laughs> um, think about your users. They're the one, they almost, you should consider them as your clients. They will be the one who are going to, you know, advance your career. If you don't have any users and if you want to build your career around software, then there's no point. So think about how would that student behave or react if they saw your code? Would they be, you know, would they be able to use it? Would they be interested in the method? Do you think your method is actually answering an important question in biology? All these things is always oriented towards, uh, you know, outward. Um, you know, how, how is the community going to um, use your tools? Excellent. So don't build it in that will come mentality, but really think about what your users need. That's a very good take home. Uh, Fred, what would you take home be? I sort of want to say GitHub because if you know how to use GitHub, then you've got a lot of things covered already, like knowing how to do simple stuff like cloning repos and installing programs from GitHub. If you use R, you, you still have to use Bioconductor and install stuff on um, from GitHub sometimes. Uh, and then you also get an opportunity to learn Markdown, which I think is really useful. Again, transferable in R Markdown for generating cool reports. Um, but I think for, if I have to give something specifically to biologists, if there's any uh, biologists that are really interested in getting more into software development programming, I can just 
learn anything. Doesn't matter if it's R Python, if it's your first language, just learn something, get good at it. Don't, you don't have to be the best, but get pretty comf comfortable with it. And then every next thing will be a bit easier. Oh, nice. That's very good. Yeah, get going. It's not magic. <laughs> Brilliant. Sonica, what is your tool or take home message? So I think if you want, you know, wider reachability of, of your soft piece of software, if you make it least technology dependent uh, in, in the sense that, you know, you don't need specialized skills to use the tool, uh, that probably will go a long way. Brilliant. Thank you. And Gordon, take us home. Um, well, I'm glad you asked this question because in a way I thought that the topic of the panel discussion almost had things around the wrong way. It's like, how can you get credit for software? And it should be, how do you write decent software in the first place um, and get it get it going? So, so you have to solve an important problem. You have to implement, it, implement methods efficiently and robustly. You have to have a good user interface as Kim Ann was saying, you know, who, who's your market? If you're going for non-sophisticated, if you go, if you want to go for people who don't know our Markdown or don't know GitHub or, uh, you know, who are, you know, relatively in, unsophisticated users, you have to provide them with an easy in interface and uh, documentation and user support and long-term maintenance and answering questions. So, yeah, it's a long project. Excellent. Thank you so much. I, I definitely, um, I, I want to say I learned so much, but I mean, intuitively, I think I knew all of that, but it's good to hear it back from the experts to really drive that home, that good software practice, looking for your users and staying at the cutting edge is the core. There's no magic to success. It's just really staying uh, on top of your game. Good. With that, back to Christina for wrapping it up. Well, thanks very much, Dennis, and thank you to all of our panellists. It's been a great discussion, but unfortunately, we are coming to the end of our time together. Thanks also to everyone in the audience. The um, chat going on at the moment has been wonderful, and we will wrap that into something that we share back um, with the registrants afterwards. I'd once again just like to thank our appreciation to all of today's speakers for taking the time to share um, your valuable insights, and a special thanks to Dennis for guiding us through all the topics. To wrap up, I would like to highlight a couple of other events of interest. To find your next great event, uh, I can recommend all of the places listed on the screen here. The Biocommons has a regular program of free national bioinformatics workshops and webinars. Abacus presents a monthly national seminar series with a great lineup of speakers. I know the link here does say 2021, but it takes you to exactly the right place to sign on for this year's online seminars. ARDC uh, also offer a great range of high quality um, uh, training and um, talks, and one of them is coming up very soon. You can register for the webinar for recommendations to make research code visible by heading to the ARD website. And uh, Paola has also put the link in the chat um, during uh, this discussion. You can register directly. We'll follow up with those details in the email as well. As you leave today's session, we'd like you to take a moment to let us know what you thought about the panel discussion by filling in the quick feedback survey that pops up on your screen. This helps us to plan our future events together. So thanks so much for taking part in today's discussion. It was co-hosted by Australian Biocommons, Abacus and the ARDC software program. The event forms part of the implementation of the ARDC National Research Software Agenda. And you might like to have a look at the agenda here. The link is on the screen for more details. We do hope that you'll join us again sometime. But until then, goodbye. <laughs>